Our top story comes from the world of medicine. Leprosy, probably not something you worry about on a regular basis, even though approximately 200,000 new cases are reported each year, although mostly in the developing world. So scientists at the University of Edinburgh are still studying it and have made some interesting discoveries. It's caused by a bacteria that initially hijacks Schwann cells living inside them. The bacteria actually have to stay inside human cells to avoid detection by the immune system. However, they quickly grow bored of just growing inside Schwann cells, so trigger their conversion into stem cells. These stem cells are mobile and drift through the body, also degrading the condition of nerves in the process. In experiments with mice, these bacteria-ridden stem cells seem to be able to settle in a variety of tissues, such as muscle and bone. This is the first known instance of something like a bacteria actually causing this kind of cellular change. But it gets even crazier. The hijacked stem cells also release chemicals that attract immune cells called macrophages. Some of the bacteria are able to jump ship and use the macrophages as a secondary mobile host for spreading the disease. Now knowing this will hopefully allow scientists and doctors to detect leprosy before symptoms arise by looking for the biochemical signatures of these stem cells, as they are not usually found in the body and the disease is treatable with a multidrug regimen. Perhaps more importantly, though, is understanding how the bacteria converts normal cells into stem cells. Without direct genetic manipulation, the bacteria are able to create versatile and resilient stem cells without certain side effects of our current methods. Ironically, this devastating and still harmful disease may be the key to unlocking the potential of stem cells in regenerative medicine. We begin with an update from the world of medicine. If someone's liver is failing, they're basically screwed unless they can get a transplant. And while we wait for regenerative medicine researchers to work out all the challenges of printing human organs, we may need to turn to some other species, which is what a scientist from the U.S. Department of Agriculture has been doing when studying a particular cell line, a very special immortal cell line developed from embryonic stem cells that came from a pig embryo called PICM-19. The cell line was created in 1991 and can divide essentially forever. It's been used to study how stem cells differentiate into many various cell types, and several cells found in the liver were successfully derived. One of them being hepatocytes, responsible for many of the metabolic functions associated with the liver, secreting bile, storing glucagon to control blood sugar, processing cholesterol and other lipids, and most importantly, scrubbing the bloodstream of toxins. Artificial livers could be made containing these pig-derived liver cells, probably a porous structure that allowed certain metabolites and toxins in and out, but not direct contact with the human bloodstream and immune system. Experiments with these cells inside a test tube have already been promising. One challenge to overcome will be growing this cell line without feeder cells, generally mouse cells that help support the pig cells. Even before that's done, these immortal cells can be used to study various diseases that involve the liver. They've already been used to study malaria, toxoplasmosis, and hepatitis. Another really cool idea is subjecting the liver cells to evolution-style selective pressures. Because the cells come from an essentially infinite source, researchers could just keep doing this until the liver cells became even more efficient or specialized in processing toxins allowing artificial livers to potentially be even better than the original tissue for certain tasks. Next is news from the world of medicine. Bees are awesome because they make honey and pollinate many of our crops, but kind of suck when they sting people. However, this sting may actually end up saving lives. A group from Washington University have developed anti-HIV nanoparticles using a toxin found in bee venom, particularly a compound called melitin capable of poking holes into membranes, including the protective covering of HIV and other viruses. Obviously, this would, and does, damage any kind of membrane if directly injected, but that's where the clever bit comes in. The nanoparticles have the melitin along the surface in addition to protective bumpers. These allow the particles to harmlessly bounce off something this size of a human cell while allowing the tiny viruses to get up close and personal with the toxin. By attacking something as fundamental as the virus's protein coating, it makes it difficult to evolve a defense, 
whereas many drugs that target HIV interfere with very specific mechanisms in their replication, and some are already becoming ineffective. The idea is that these nanoparticles could actually be developed into a gel that could prevent the sexual transmission of HIV, in addition to being developed as an intravenous drug to destroy the virus in the bloodstream but it's still new and more testing is required. This story is an excellent opportunity to mention the charity livestream we'll be participating in the weekend of April 6th and 7th. It's to raise money for two excellent HIV-related charities, and we'll be doing a live version of the Brain Drizzle podcast for an hour on Sunday. Check the video link at the top of the description for all the details. We end with exciting news from the world of biology. Malaria is a devastating disease affecting millions of people in parts of Africa, Asia, and around the world. It's caused by a protozoan parasite and is primarily transmitted through mosquitoes. Some groups have attempted to stop the spread of this disease by directly interfering with the mosquitoes themselves. So one group, funded by the National Institute of Health, is attempting to fight fire with fire in that they established a bacterial infection in a mosquito population that seems to make them immune to the malaria-causing parasite. Called Wolbachia, it's a relatively common bacteria that infects insects but not humans, and it doesn't seem to hamper the mosquitoes very much either. What it does do is prevent malaria from growing inside the mosquitoes. The group isn't entirely sure why this all happened, but they hypothesized that the bacteria is producing reactive oxygen species as a waste product, which the malaria parasite can't handle. Infecting embryos and raising them to maturity created a heritable infection of the Wolbachia bacteria passed down from mother to offspring. It was passed down for 34 successive generations until the study ended, and another experiment introduced different amounts of infected females into a normal population. Starting with as little as 5%, the entire population was in carrying the bacteria within eight generations. This same bacteria has also been used to limit the spread of the dengue virus, also mosquito transmitted. And their hope is to incorporate this into other malaria-fighting strategies. Our next story comes from the world of medicine. Researchers at Virginia Commonwealth University have been developing a gene therapy to eliminate cancer with some encouraging results. As we have discussed before, current treatments for cancer aren't the best. Even when they are successful at curing a person, they often have very serious side effects, and there are already certain cancers that are resistant to conventional drugs. One researcher from this group originally cloned a human gene that had multiple roles. It is involved in the development of blood vessels, but more importantly directly relates to cell suicide, and also promotes the destruction of cancer in the immune system. So the idea was to deliver this gene right into cancer cells while leaving healthy cells alone. Working with multiple adenovirus vectors, they showed several successful tests using the IL-24 gene. It selectively infected and destroyed breast cancer stem cells in a petri dish while ignoring normal breast stem cells. In mouse models, it greatly inhibited tumor growth based on cancer stem cells, both primary and secondary tumors injected throughout the body. And a phase one human trial has shown that this kind of therapy is at least safe. The researchers have also been refining the delivery virus itself, creating a so-called cancer terminator vector that specifically replicates in cancer cells. This is interesting because for safety reasons, some gene therapy vectors have replication disabled altogether, but allowing it to specifically replicate should make treatment more effective. Although current work has been done with breast cancer cells, the researchers believe it could be effective in a wide variety of cancer types. Next is further research on the IL-24 gene and delivery methods, hopefully with further human trials in the future.